I'm reading Lawson Anata's poem, Singing the Song, and um, it's hard for me to read it because I've known Lawson since we were in Eugene in the 1960s, and I've heard him read a lot of times, and nobody can read his work the way he does. Uh, he's got a, a kind of swing, but I'll, I'll just do something simple here and hope to not mangle it. Oh, east is east and west is west, and the wrong one I have chose. I caught myself singing that song last week, leaving Les Schwab. A natural reaction because how western can you get, as it naturally became 1948. Man, that was a funny movie. The Pale Face with Bob Hope as a bumbling traveling dentist while the sultry Jane Russell lamented being out west. Thus she sang, buttons and bows, Oh, my bones denounce the buckboard bounce and the cactus hurts my toes. Still a great song, classic. And the classic made up engine was a hoot, the same as movie Negroes, Orientals, and Mexicans were to be laughed at. No matter if that was the very makeup your, of your fifth grade class. Hey, sing it during recess. Oh, east is west and west because it's easy to sing, easy to memorize. And don't mean a thing in California, the vineyards and cotton fields of the San Joaquin Valley. That was the beauty of it. You could go to the show and always come home to home to your own ways and food. Remember Lawson? I hear he's way up north, supposed to be writing some poetry. <laughs> I'm Camel Steele from Pendleton. This is Swimming for Mission. Here is an evening, a crest of cloud rising over the blues, and in the west, the sky behind Battle Mountain, brilliant with dust and fire smoke. Below us, the reservation eddies at the edge of town. Home is there, somewhere between the humming grain elevator and the truck stop where lights are just now coming on. It's my turn to get the gate. You ease the pickup past, jarring over the cattle guard, rattling tools and chains on the flatbed. I wait, then turn to close the latch, and I am caught in the undertow of grasses that shiver between me and the highway and in the current of wind vibrating a barbed wire. I turn back. Your cigarette flares in the side mirror. You tap the brake lights, ready to go, but I am already gone, swimming the distances that shimmer between here and home, my voice lost to the sound of muffler and wind, swimming to where geese pick at threadbare fields, and the sky throws down obsidian arrows of crows. I'm John Daniel from the Coast Range Foothills west of Eugene. The home stretch in the first week of March. I-84 delivers us to the Snake River crossing at Ontario, and the truck and I are in Oregon again, cruising west on US-20. Flat fields, sour with the scent of last year's onions, are just coloring up with green. At Vail, where there is no Vail, and no Ontario in Ontario, named by a homesick Canadian. <laughs> We pick up the Mount Here River with its raw cut banks, mergansers drifting the easy current. Blue hills ahead turn warmly brown as they gather us in, the road weaving into higher country of junipers and crops of lava. It looked the same, I bet, except for the cheap grass to the pioneers and to Indians long before. A magpie flies from a fence post, Angus and Herefords hulk behind barbed wire. Now Juntura, where the Malheur Forks join up, Bible Church at one end of town, Little Brick Catholic at the other. Highway 20 climbs again, past the white ranch house with its poplar windbreak, hay bailed up in giant rolls. Drink water pass, stinking water pass, the names back then might have saved your life. Then down into the northern fringe of the Great Basin, crossing shallow streams south flowing to the Malheur marshes where raucous geese soon will swarm. The pavement shoots 20 miles dead straight on the dry bed of a Pleistocene lake, 
the truck running fast and free, a windmill, three paints nosing sparse grass. Fifty miles south, Steens Mountain stands in white solitude, called Snow Mountain on old maps. And now Burns, boasting espresso shops and a McDonald's in Steens Mountain Plaza. Not even Burns is immune, but the coffee, pretty good coffee, rides warm in my belly. South on the highway, then west, the, high, the country takes on a broad roll. Too early still for sage grouse strutting near Sage Hill Summit. Too early for the blue haze of Camas and the Riley Swales, where you might see Sandhill Cranes. US 2010's northwest in winding loops, rising and falling past Squaw, Glass, and Hampton Buttes, all traced with snow. Phone poles pace alongside, mottled cheek turns rich in evening sun. Three crows, a tan double wide, and now on the western horizon, three points like arrowhead tips. The sisters? They dip away, pop up, dip again, then rise in full. The snowy blue sisters, all right, backlit with a saffron sky, broken top to their south. We pass the eye blink town of brothers, named by lonely sheep herders watching th the sisters from three small bumps in the desert and on through the twilight to bend. After breakfast and a fill up, we quickly flee Recreationville, always a crossroads. Pioneers forded the Deschutes here at a double curve called Farewell Bend, but the traffic's a mite thicker now. The highway leads past nouveau mansions and fresh manufactured homes on sagebrush flats. The sisters rise near and huge off the truck's port bow, the two who like to talk to each other, the third who keeps to herself. Mount Washington, square shoulders with a pinhead of rock, three-fingered jack with more like two. Classic Jefferson, sleek with snow, hood hunkered far to the north. Landmarks to natives and trappers and settlers, landmarks today. Some states are strewn with peaks, ours are few and singular. Junipers verge into ponderosa pines as the truck climbs the grade, the first tall trees since leaving Oregon 10 weeks ago. Mountain hemlocks, lodgepole pines, and we hum over Sandium Pass and south on 126, the truck running strong like a horse that just sniffed home, bright water spilling from mossy cliffs. Down and down through the wet barked Douglas firs, each in its own snow well, dirty snow mounded along the shoulder, the Mackenzie flashing through the woods. From Blue River on, the high slopes show off their bad buzz cuts. I like shaggy mountains myself. On the flats at Lieber, a few early blooms in the orchards, we pass sheep and llamas ripping the greenest of grass and rejoin the weather that makes it so. Clear sailing all three days from Chicago, 2,000 miles of winter sun, and now my dear Willamette Valley, sprinkling rain. Skirting north of Eugene, we roll past cormorants airing their wings and a great blue heron in a pond by the Long Tom River, home waters, pastures, woodlots, Glimpses of the modest coast range drifted with mist, the road steering us along known curves and grades. A last straightaway, two small hills turn left and we're crunching the gravel of home. I pat the dashboard, switch off the motor, clamber out stiff and happy. The dripping dug firs are right where I left them, 150 feet tall. They were putting down roots about the time my great-grandfather shipped out from Prussia for a new life in Missouri. They'll stand, I hope, long after I die. I circle the place in a stroll, taking in Winter Creek's lively song and moist air scented with duff and soil, bearing news of trillium preparing to rise, blind moles swimming their tunnels, and fungi spreading intricate webs news of that darkness from which ferns and forests and even words sometimes will find their way. I'm reading <coughs> Rob Whitbeck's poem. He's from Winlock, a small town that is east of Fossil. 
couldn't be here. He's working in the uh, Wyoming oil fields. <laughs> Thirty years ago, uh, he started uh, his interest in a, in a small uh, property in the But uh, doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. This is an intense poem called These Cascades. It's got uh, five stanzas. The first three are directions to the reader to, to go with him to this new place uh, east of Springfield, which is his home. And then he switches uh, to an autobiographical uh, comment in the last uh, closing stanzas. A couple of words here. As his editor and publisher, I, I queried him about the use of series, C-E-R-E-S, uh, to yellow-orange color, uh, named after the green goddess, and the word afference, which I had never heard, uh, bearing or conducting inward, nerve impulses from the periphery to the center. It's a very rich poem. These Cascades. Go inland and ascend the long miles, the deepening draws. Push eastward, up the slopes. Press the cascades, then drop into their lee. Salal and sorrow yield to rock press and current. Echoes of Chinook to Hopkin and moss to this dust. Behind you, Clouds bank against the range, ground fog, serious, then buries your old valleys, their brown sloughs and mist blazing the gray quarries, while before you, on the young pumice, a new sunlight is shattered. Farther, roots in the rain shadow grow fewer but deeper, and the salt falls sheer to the churning river water. What afference rules our veins, those bloodlines coursing toward the heart? What seizes the mind then moves you to greater care? I left graves west of those mountains, Axat and Blanches, Ira and Myrons, headstones beneath hemlock and cedar, forebears received into the hills above Marcola, where their sweat spilled on hot fields their hands hardened on sad irons and whipsaws. I left that Oregon, racing, drenched, ever torn from its moorings, and entered another, vaster, poorer, nearer the sunrise, nearer the past. The time in dry outlands slowed, slightly stayed. To remain, I gave it 30 years of my labor. I gave it my life. My name is Barbara Drake. I'm going to read um, my poem, Round Trip Out Here, Albor Desert. I was just thinking, how many years ago did you leave the West Side? Did I? Uh huh. Um, close to 20. Yeah, it was a long Because I met you, you were a West Sider in right. Silverton. Silverton. <laughs> yeah. So. I've been both sides. Yeah, both sides now, right? Um, I'm one of those people raised on the west side who at one time in my life had the mistaken idea that everything was on the west side. And um, in the 80s, I was started going out to Malheur, and uh, at Linfield, I taught an environmental lit course with a botanist for many years, and she knows about all the plants and things out there, and so I can't even count the many times I've, how many times I've gone out there now and just love it, and it was such a discovery to go there in the 80s at the time that the Great Basin was filling up with water and the roads were flooded, and it was uh, just wonderful, and I love it still, and we're going there again in May. Road trip now here, Alvor Desert. The two women working in the Fields Cafe both call their husbands dad. Dad and dad come in to eat supper. <laughs> eat supper time spaghetti. As we do, hungry after our long drive across the state from the Yamhill Valley. We've brought our homemade west side wine to drink with dinner and offer a glass. But one dad tells us his choice is franzia. He drinks a tumbler of it with his spaghetti. Two. 
On the wall, a sign announces, we have sold 829 famous milkshakes since January 1st. We have sold 1,056 hamburgers since January 1st. It's only May. Before we leave this place, we'll, both, we'll try both and raise the bar a little. The BLM guy tells us, this time each year, milkshakes begin to overtake hamburgers. <laughs> By midsummer, milkshakes will rule. <laughs> Three, the price for a motel room is displayed on the back of the menu, tempting. Last night we slept in the back of the truck, but today consider renting a room because a storm is blowing in wet and wind that drove us off the back roads we've been exploring. No good getting stuck in desert gumbo, but the few rooms have all been rented. The truck will do. We have a mattress in the back, warm sleeping bags, pillows, wool socks, a watertight roof, sleeping spoon fashion. We don't need more than this. Fields is the four. Fields is home to half a dozen families and at least that many dogs, most of which are lounging in front of the store when morning comes. Missing my dogs left at home, I say howdy to these scratch hairy chins. Five. Birds sighted this trip. Bristle five, curlew one. Black crowned night herons eight. Great horned owls two, with babies two. The owlets, not yet fledged, stare at us in the shade of black cottonwoods. And there are yellow-headed blackbirds, avocets, willets, wimbrels, red-legged stilts, killdeer, coots, cinnamon teal, shovelers, tundra swans, sandhill cranes, white pelicans, Canada, Canada geese, all more than we can count. White-faced ibis, like figures on the wall of an Egyptian tomb, flash purple and green iridescence and black. One golden eagle on a telephone pole dries his feathers. Six. Our catalog of plants spotted includes yampa, bitterroot, winterfat, wild onion, calichortus, paintbrush, lupin, lupinus bidlii, and others less rare. Larkspur, sagebrush, saltbush, phlox, ephedra, or Mormon tea. At the winterfat site, we climbed a ridge and found the bitterroot in bloom. Tasted some, also wild onions, yampa roots, all once harvested by Native Americans here. Yampa tastes a little like celery root or turnip. Bitter root is astringent. Nox noxious plants we see this trip include cheatgrass, knapweed, star thistle, perennial, perennial pepperweed, Mediterranean sage, invasive species like us. But we do our best to treat this landscape well. We promise we won't take root and spread, however much this place charms us. Seven. Thirty-one miles north of Fields, Mickey Hot Springs has been fenced from cattle since we were here last. Under a chilly sky, I soak my feet in the one tolerable pool. My skin prickles, legs look greenish white beneath water. In other hot pots, mud boils and bubbles, water would scald. The geyser is a foot-high spout. Some of the pools are empty now where water found its way elsewhere. But you never know on this volatile surface it could come back. Eight. On the playa in the Alvord, a salt-white 12 by 5 mile area, someone once set a land speed record, but it's now forbidden to racing. We go to the middle, pose in the flatness to have our pictures taken. We were here. And nine, last section. Next day, the dads are back for breakfast. The storm has passed, and the kind ladies of fields have pancakes and bacon on the griddle. Well fed, we will invest the day in wildflowers, birds, distances, light. Once I thought true Oregon was only on the west side of the Cascades, that east was wasteland. Now I can't get enough of this broad sky, this world we have ridden to its end and its beginning. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Waterston from Bend, Oregon. Um, 
I'll be reading my poem, Scale House. A scale house is a structure on a ranch that has an outdoor kind of a structure for running cattle in and weighing them, and then somebody stands inside and, and calibrates the weight. Uh, the only other thing you might need to know um, are the terms culls and dries, basically both refer to um, cattle that will get shipped, that are deemed unworthy. Scale house. On the other side of this desert, these mountains, there's still more west. So far I've traveled 2,700 miles in that direction, you guess at some point I'd meet up with myself. Instead, I settled for somewhere east of my imagined Eden. Here, sage leans its small gray shoulders into the scorch of day. Desert lilies push through pumice. This notion of blooming in volcanic ash I have come to understand. Dreamlike now, those days I'd haze our cows, culls, and dries onto the scale. My husband, he died in 08, dead as a nit, is how the hired man put it, would joggle the weights into the notches, write the totals on paper scraps, fragments of my discarded poems. Black Baldy number 275, 1500 pounds, scrawled on the back of We Are Something's Awareness. Hereford, 313, 1700 pounds on the reverse of they loved within their means. The balance arm floating in carefully calibrated space. The whole time the stock dog would sit, wagging, staring at one spot on the scale house wall. He heard something, a mouse, behind the boards. He'd wait it out, however long it took. Behind this desert, these mountains, I can hear a sound, a promise, something. I'm waiting it out. Next, my husband would bark all business, playful I'd take a turn, step on the scale platform and watch as he calculated the weight of my life as countered by hope. Mm. 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 I'm going to read Kim Stafford's poem, Not the Rivers. The first, someone here will know uh, the pronunciation of this place name. Sup Lee? Supli. 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 See? <laughs> Not of rivers. Blue day and dry country, following a dirt track, fragrant sage and juniper, out southeast from Bend. I found the sign, wind gnawed silver, reaching one arm north for the Dalles and one arm south for San Francisco. Sun whittled letters flaking from the pine. I looked long along the ruts toward those exotic words, mirage. If you walk the soft green banks of rivers and dry mountains, the upper kinks of the crooked, the slow wandering run of John Day, lazy purling bounty of young Deschutes, you inhabit the inner mind of what Portland claims, the knot of rivers where that dry land treasure gathers in a blue hemp bag to hold the people. Where the company town once stood, out past Supli, we found ten three-stair remnants from a row of gone families, children, the leap from porches of a morning and the slow trudge mounting home. And we thought of Portland booming from the lumber milled here until our kind yanked houses from the ground at the bus. And once in the Ochicos, we took the car down a gulch with no hope of turning around wagered the track we chose would go through, hurtled flickering shadows and thickets until we found the clearing, the cabin with one wall fallen, but curtains yet, the old black stove, the table on three good legs, still holding the oilcloth oil cloth span that spoke holdout civilization. The knotted, knotted skein of all rivers in this country may delve our imaginations to the hidden, the sacred, the forgotten, and the scattered source. Web holds due, map of our concern. Network of water is so snug, the root fiber of all being. Lonely city, 
Can your rootless citizens remember how far east it all began, among pines where sunlight fell? Hi, I'm Paul Ann Peterson. I have the pleasure of reading Shandel Beer's poem. Shandel lives in Pendleton and she teaches at the Blue Mountain Community College campus in Pendleton. This poem of hers is called The Gift and there is a dedication. The, the poem is dedicated, it is For My Golden Eagles, The Gift. My students at the Res School carry their toughness like currency. On Facebook, one senior says he's a six foot six badass Native American. The students work their way around the no swearing in class rule by saying, what the F, you're so full of S. The day I ask the class, what would you ask the author if he were here? The normally quiet but smart girl says, I'd ask him, are you my father? Because I've never met that bastard in my life. <laughs> we all laugh because it's the most honest answer that can be given. We laugh because honesty is uncomfortable here in this trailer where I'm supposed to lie to these high schoolers, tell them if they work hard enough, they can be anything. The way the lie was told to me. We laugh because we're all in this together. Our falling apart houses and cars and hearts and lives. I wish I could tell them the thing that you have is this, the vastness, the peacocks in the middle of the road, the man playing air guitar as he walks along Mission Highway. And I know, children, that this isn't much, but it's the gift, the one gift these stories that can't be taken away. Shane Beers from Pendleton. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's probably my fault. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ellen. I have the pleasure of reading <laughs> Charles Goodrich from Corvallis. Aspens and Vandals, one, west side. Firs, alders, and maples grow thick and intermingled here in the valley, and the undergrowth of snowberry and Indian plum gets all snarled up with Himalayan blackberry. Throw in the rank entanglements of email, job obligations, family snits, and it gets a little claustrophobic. I need a road trip, a couple of nights camping solo on the east side, a quick jaunt into low-down loneliness to remind me how much I miss your touch when I go without it for a while. Two, east side. Beyond Madras, every juniper has bare ground around it, the space I've been craving. Through the Ochicos, the highway flickers between overgrown lodge poles, skinny and dying. But down a nameless dirt road, I find a grove of big ponderosas. And at the far end of a meadowy swale, a dozen aspens rustle and sway in the evening breeze. Remember our honeymoon in the strawberries 20 years ago? Camped in a grove of aspens that sugared the air and turned every breeze to a whispering voice. That's where we punctured our air mattress, making love without checking for twigs. <laughs> now, at dusk, missing you, I walk among the aspens, 
touching their trunks, breathing their scent, and trying to picture the lovers, deer hunters, and beer-guzzling vandals who have carved their initials into all these trees. Alone in the mountains, beyond cell phone reception, lonelier than I set out to be, I fall back on old technology and an outmoded brand of sentiment, with evening coming on in the bark of a slender young aspen. I carve our initials inside a fresh heart. Um, this poem is by M. E. Hope of Klamath Falls, called Passing. The underside of the rain clouds are the same silver gray of the cat who died yesterday. The same glowing gray of the pigeons along the railroad side. The same pewter that Lake Iwana has become today as the white pelicans rotate in the wind ready for landing. Today's breeze holds promise. The latest snowfall is above the basin floor. And a field planted early last week has slim green lines teasing the soil. Calendar says late April, but the aspen are thin and bare, shocking white when the sun hits. The daffodils, four inches high, have tight yellow buds like fingers pointing west. Today we'll bring every whip, and the tuxedo tom will sit on the stone monument built for his partner and endure every shower in sad mourning. And I think of Mr. Berkmeister, who debated planting sweet peas the spring after his wife died, who said they always bloomed on her birthday, and wondered aloud, how could he savor that day any longer? Lamb again. <laughs> um, when the most recent link of this poem chain reached me, um, there was Mary, Emmy Hope's poem that Ursula just read for you, uh, talking about the pelicans on Klamath Lake. And I thought about, well, I lived in Klamath Falls for 31 years. And I thought about my life there the birds, you're right under the Pacific Flyway when you're in Klamath Falls. And uh, I actually I didn't live in Klamath Falls. I lived about eight miles south of town in an old farmhouse surrounded by farmland that didn't belong to us, um, fields where the farmer planted alfalfa, sometimes potatoes, uh, a small pasture across our driveway that didn't belong to us. and. Uh, a bit north of us, a beautiful big old barn that also did not belong to us, in which owls very often roosted. Threshold. On his palm, lifted toward my eyes, cough balls, he says. The balls that owls throw up, he breaks one open, points to tiny bones, shreds of fur, gristle threads, what the owl couldn't digest, small clots of brown scruff he's taken out of a plastic bag, this man at the door, me here alone, him talking fast all the while, biology labs, high school, a supplier pays him, he can see the barn in that field behind our house, big barn. Surely owls must roost there. Kids opening each one up, microscope, a worksheet to record the contents. I lean on the door jam, a day's work waiting behind me, dust and dog hair convening in corners, the weeks eight loaves of bread set to rise, 
A New Yorker story, three quarters read, laid aside. Behind this man, across our driveway, beyond his parked pickup truck, Manning's pasture, the two mares, having heard our voices now at the fence, knowing I maybe have windfalls or velvety lips, maybe not, they wait. I watch his mouth shape his soft links of sound. The barn floor must be littered with castings. Surely I don't mind. His hands upturned, rising toward me. I'm barely inside. He's barely out. What can I say? Small lives lie in his hands. White bone of field's hidden world its lacy chain. His voice steady, quick, the owl's his living. In the palm of his hand, the swallowed lives that keep broad wings beating. How many nights have I waited barefoot on linoleum, everyone else asleep, sliding open that north window nearest the field stark still and until I can hear owls call back and forth across the mown hay. He knows he has me, swallowing hard, wanting so little, too much. My voice says, I have to say, it's not our barn, what you want not mine to give away. I'm Betty Lynch Husted from Pendleton, and I'm fortunate to, in Pendleton, just outside of Pendleton and Echo, there's, uh, you can still see wagon marks from the Oregon Trail. This is called Signposts on the Oregon Trail. <coughs> Morning on NPR, another balmy. A man suddenly without legs, still trying to stand, so all that is over for him. My palms sudden sweat on the wheel. In the high desert air, an osprey stalls, hovers, mottled tail fanning wide. Quick splash, roadside lake broken white. Dark wings pushing back into light. Body shaking water like a feathered dog. The freeway shimmers, crests, Wreath ridge floats out through waves of sage. Warning, blowing dust next 40 miles when lights flash. Today, only wheat harvest haze cushions the horizon, familiar illusion of safe passage home. The traffic pushes westward. In the gorge, turkey vultures loop from the salt cliffs. Hollow bones once lifted condors and the Umatilla birdman flew with swans. Warning, land may slide next 20 miles when lights flash. Buried by dust or mud, as if we could choose, where mountains divide the clouds in this state, we claim sides. Here, the river runs wide. Beyond that forested ridge, earth gathers her force. St. Helens, Lewitt, beauty in any tongue. <coughs> Will she announce her next birth? Fly banners of white hot steam? Elders speak of a bridge where Lewitt once tended her fire, sharing its warmth equally with people on both river shores. Ashes, stories, dreams. I didn't realize Betty found the way around. She <laughs> <laughs> trying to get through. Oh, <laughs> uh, Marcella, this, this is my home. Um, we have lived on the west side for 50 years, but uh, somewhere along about 25 years in, we discovered the rest of Oregon. <laughs> and we've been going out to Harney County now once a year couldn't live without it. 
Uh, this is the only rhyming poem in the book, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's called Crossing the Cascade. <laughs> Words for a country song. <laughs> Coming down the cloudy side, leaving the bright behind us. Isn't any place to hide where the rain won't find us. Driving down so low, so fast, all the sunlight in the past. Coming down the cloudy side to another weather. Gotta be a place to hide and try to stay together. Driving down so low, so fast, all the sunlight in the past. The world looks so cold and wide, coming down the cloudy side. <laughs> I grew up on the west side and moved to Mandras when I was 24 years old and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> the east side of work. <laughs> now I don't think I could wake up without seeing the mountains outside of the window. And this story, this poem is a little bit about the adjustment of coming from the west and moving to the east. Natural history. The beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names, Chinese saying. Once I knew the name of the maples that dragged their heavy leaves along the foggy plain. Born into the mystery of fir and oak, of trout lilies and licorice fern, that world was familiar, ordinary. Moody but mutable, I have adapted to more arid climes. Bitterroot, sage, and juniper, my new lexicon. In the unpublished manuscript of my personal field guide, New trees, birds, and flowers measure my immigrant status. Transplanted into an unfamiliar landscape, I have pared down, become spare, finally the right shape for the desert, but still remembering the old names, never forgetting the love in them. Okay, on the westernmost edge of the east, <laughs> I'm Penelope Shaw, and I live half the week in Portland, and the other half of the week in Denver, which is just south of the Dallas. On the westernmost edge of east, at the farthest east edge of the Mount Hood Forest, high over 15 Mile Creek, an open spot on the ridge, long view of the home valley past the last stand of trees, toward rows of golden hills in the country of dry wheat. At the east end of the valley, past dwindling ponderosas, a tidy march of orchard crest the ridge, and two lines of crowded cottonwoods squeeze the moving creek past Ramsey Grange down gently now down through the Dufer Valley on into town. Small houses clustered between hand-planted trees, hedges, lawns, the green of good intentions, churches and schools, post office flag, <coughs> hardware, grocery store, just one bar. Here in Dufer, Ranchers and wheat farmers drink coffee. Up in the fields, cows munch wheat stubble. And this morning, Mount Hood glows freshly white, rising higher than the silver grain elevators, then meadowlark song in June, into a wide and perfect sky. Every place is some place, but this is where places Neat. Stop. From here, you almost feel the planet rolling east. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Hearing it all like this together. I hope this has whispers of all of you. In conclusion, the trail trips east. Coming down the bright side, leaving the cloudy side behind. And south and north. But how far west can we go? 
the land narrows between the mountains, making the urge to touch stronger. Traveling in any direction, but especially to the east. Coming down the bright side, leaving the cloudy side behind. To approach that hole through Mount Jefferson and glimpse Coyote, the trickster, and a first intake of the widening sky. Rocks and juniper provide occasional answers, rare distractions, the things owls can't digest, suggesting a crest of clouds, a place to meet up with ourselves, rising over the Ochicos, the Blues, drink water, stinking water paths, leaving behind cormorants seeking a door in the air, calling out, go ahead, ascend the long miles, reading epitaphs on crumbling tombstones in lost cemeteries. As the sky opens, there are yellow-headed blackbirds, avocets, willets, killdeer, sandhill cranes, white pelicans, rotating in the air, camping the strawberries, looking toward love in a grove of aspens, watching below a slow, wandering John Day. The sky is swallowing us as an osprey stalls and falls a thousand feet, finding there that door in air. That door, that hole in Mount Jefferson that allows a poet's dialogue as if we could choose where mountains divide the clouds. Finding faces no one knows in places we have pared down. Reading petroglyphs. Are you my father? I never met the bastard. Every place is some place. Remember Lawson? Friends say he went up north writing poems. The hills east, restless still. I'd like to, on behalf of all the poets, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank them, especially for all being here. Really listening to it, it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. It really was. Mm -hmm. Thank you.